To avoid any confusion in our study of electricity, you must first understand that there are two theories. The first, the oldest theory, the pioneer theory, states that current flows in one direction while your electrons flow in the other. This has been Franklin's old theory. The modern theory of basic electricity, the theory that we will use for the next four years, states that electrons and current flow in the same direction. Your lineman's handbook uses the pioneer theory. We will not use this section. However, your book, Electricity 1 through 7, uses a modern theory, and we will use this for a reference. The first step in our study of basic electricity is in the understanding of matter. Matter is anything in nature which has weight and occupies space. This pen is matter. My tie is matter. Matter can be found in nature in three different forms, a solid and a liquid and a gas. All matter can be broken down into atoms. Atoms are the basic component that make up all elements. There are 92 natural elements in nature and they can be classified as to their atoms. atoms. An atom is the lowest form that you can reduce an element down to and still be identifiable to that particular element. Now let's take a closer look at an atom. We stated that the lowest form that you could reduce an element down to and still be identifiable to that element is an atom. Now the atomic structure then of all the elements are different. If we would go to the table of elements, we would find there an atomic number for each particular element, starting out with one hydrogen and going on through our elements. We want to take a closer look at the elements. Well, let's take an atom and break that atom on down to its three elementary particles or subatomic particles. The subatomic particles will be the electron, which is negative, the proton, which is positive, and the neutron, which has no charge at all. It's neutral in charge. We are not particularly interested in, in the neutron. Now, the atomic number, as I say, will determine what its atomic structure looks like. Now, I'll be showing you a table in a little bit, but let's take an atomic number for aluminum. Now, aluminum, which has an atomic symbol of Al, has a plus 13. In other words, the atomic number of aluminum is 13. Now, we stated that there will be protons, which are positive, electrons, which are negative, and neutrons, which have no charge at all. Now, those are the subatomic particles that will be in all atoms of all elements. Now, the structure of our atoms is such that we have a nucleus in the center. And the atomic number of an element determines how many protons will be within that nucleus. In other words, I'm going to have for aluminum, I'll have a plus 13. It would be 13 protons. Now, a, a neutral atom will have just as many electrons orbiting around the outside as it will protons on the inside. Now, another thing is that we said we had six protons within the nucleus. We also have neutrons in there, and like I say, we aren't particularly interested in those. Now, the protons are positive, the electrons being negative, 
the electrons are three times the size, but only one, 1,845th of the weight of the proton. So the proton is quite heavy. In fact, that's what holds that those protons within that nucleus is their, is their weight. Now, the electrons that orbit around the outside of this nucleus have ring structures. In other words, there will be a ring, and we call that a shell, and the first shell can only hold two electrons, so I would put a two uh, electrons in this first shell. Now, it'll completely orbit around the outside of this nucleus. Now, in the next shell, we can, we can have eight in the next shell. The, the, first, the first one can only hold two, the next one can only hold, uh, hold eight. Now, if I was to break, break this shells down into subshells, you would see that I would first have two in a subshell, then in, in the next subshell, I would have six. In other words, two subshells make up the second shell of this particular uh, element. Now, you'll see if I start counting, I've got two, and then I've got eight, I've got ten. Now, as I go on out to the next shell, you'll see I'll have two, then I've only got one left over, so I'll have one uh, electron orbiting around the outside of this uh, nucleus that uh, in the outer shell of, of the atom. Now, like I say, this, this, these are energy levels. We can only have two, eight, 18, 32. This is the way you would move out on, a, on, a, on an atom. Aluminum is not as good a conductor as copper. If I would show you an element such as copper, if we would look up copper, you would find that we would have 29 for an atomic number, and copper, the atomic symbol is, is Cu. If I would draw this ring structure out, you would see I would have plus 29 within the nucleus. So I'll have 29 protons within the nucleus. If I show the energy levels on copper, you'll see that I'll move out. I'll have, I can have two in the first shell. I go on out, I'll have two, and then six to make up the next shell. And then I'll go on out, I'll have two, I'll have six, and uh, then I'll go out one more, which would be 10, you see. Now, if you'll look at that, you'll see the subshells uh, move out by four additional electrons as they move out. Now, see, I have two. I add on to that for the next shell. Now, I go two, I add on to that four, four, six to make eight all together in that shell. Then I go two, six, ten, and uh, to make up the next shell. Now, if you'll see, I go on out, I have I have used up 28 of my proton, so that means I have one more electron, and in this case, it's on the outer shell. Now, this outer shell, or what we call valence shell, determines whether an element is going to be conductive or non-conductive. If I have an element that uh, say has one or two, three maybe, in the outer shell, that could be a good conductor. This valence shell, like I say, determines whether it's a conductor or a non-conductor. If it has few in number, it'll be conductive. If it has a large number and yet not enough to complete the outer shell, it'll tend to want to take on uh, electrons which would then make it, make it a, a non-conductor then. In this situation, we have an element where we have the electron at a quite a distance away from the nucleus, and so that this attraction between our protons and our electrons 
is quite weak to where this electron out here can be dislodged from that atom and move through our material. This electron is, is that portion of our atom which will move through the circuit and makes for our current flow in the circuit. Now, if I have Unlike charges, there's going to be an attraction. Now, Coulomb's law states that unlike charges attract and like charges repel. The reason this electron stays close to this particular uh, nucleus of that, of that atom is that we have electrons which are negative, protons positive, so it has a natural tendency to want to stay in orbit. In other words, a neutral atom is going to have just as many protons as it does electrons. Now, there's another force here which tends to want to cause it to uh, stay at a distance. In other words, instead of colliding or c coming back into uh, the nucleus, it'll tend to want to stay away, and what holds it away is a centrifugal force. So there's two forces that, that hold an electron in a specific orbit. One is Coulomb's law, and like charges attract, and the other one is centrifugal force. The centrifugal force of the electrons around that nucleus uh, tend to hold it away. However, it's at a far enough distance away from the nucleus to where an external force applied to that could cause it to move. Now let's discuss some of our other conductive elements. We worked with aluminum. We worked with copper. Now let's discuss silver. The atomic symbol for silver is AG. It has an atomic number of 47. We said copper was 29, and we said that aluminum was 13. The larger the atomic number and the fewer the electrons on the outer shell determine how conductive it's going to be. That stands then that, that copper is a better conductor than aluminum and that silver is a better conductor than copper. If I would draw silver, the atomic stru structure of silver, we would have a plus 47. We'd have 47 protons within the nucleus. Then we would go on out in our shells. We would have two in the first shell. We would go out two and then six for the next shell. We would go out two, six, ten for the next shell. Then we would go out two, six, ten, 14, then we would find that we would have one left, one, one valence electron in the outer shell of silver. Now you remember we had one in copper. But now you can see we've got one more shell between the outer valence electron and the nucleus, which makes the force of attraction, Coulomb's law now, the force of attraction between our electron and our proton uh, weaker. And because it has few in number, in this case one, it makes it a good conductor. We want to remember also that, that this valence electron is sometimes called free electron because in our conductors that free electron will move through our circuit. You'll see where the flow of electrons will be our current flow. Okay, now then that almost sounds as though if I put gold on here, AU on here for gold, that gold with an atomic number of 79 would be an even better conductor. However, this breaks the rules. There are exceptions to the rules, and uh, this happens to be one of them. Silver, if we go on out, you'll see we'll be way on out here. We'll have a number of shells. 
and as we get on out there we'll have one free electron. However, gold is not as good a conductor as silver, so that it would be placed uh, as far as its order. You see, aluminum would be would be uh, the lowest. Uh, then we would have copper. Then we would have uh, gold, and then we would have silver. In other words, actually, the conductivity of silver would be better than the gold. The gold would be better than the copper, and so on. So gold, now, the explanation for that not being a better conductor is that uh, gold has what they call covalent bonding, which means some of your elements are, are uh, your, your electrons in their outer orbits are linked to other atoms, and uh, they aren't as free to move. So there would not be, there would be more opposition to current flow, let's put it that way. There would be more opposition to current flow in the gold than there would be the silver. Another term we want to become familiar with is compound. Compound is a combination of two or more atoms of elements linking together to form a stable substance. The lowest that we could reduce a compound down to and still be identifiable to that compound would be a molecule. So let's draw some molecules of some compounds that, uh, that you should be familiar with. I think one of the first molecules that probably you studied in school was, was, uh, was a molecule of a compound known as, as water. Uh, the atomic symbol for water is H2O, which means that we have two hydrogen linked together with one oxygen. If I was to take a molecule of oxygen and it has an atomic number of eight, if I was to draw its ring structure out, you would see I would have two. I would have two, and then I would have four. In other words, it doesn't have enough to make its outer ring structure, shells, complete. It's short, too. Let's leave out everything but its outer shell so that we'll, we'll show a, an outer shell here that has six electrons in it. Two, four, five, six. It needs two more to be complete. So what it tries to do, because it's over half on the shell, what it tries to do, it tries to take on electrons instead of giving them up, like, like, uh, like metal would do. So if I was to link together two hydrogen, now hydrogen has an atomic number of one, which means that what we've got there is one proton and one electron, and in this case, it's going to share it with the, with the oxygen. And in this case, then, we have a complete, both, both of our elements are connected such that there are no free electrons to move. That means that means water then is non-conductive. And I know a lot of you say right off the bat, well, water is conductive. Well, it's the impurities in water that, that cause water to be conductive. And of course, because it is in solution, uh, you can have a, a current flow through water. Now, let's take other compounds which you should be familiar with. You know that when we splice conductors that we must use a wire brush on aluminum and copper to clean off the oxide. And that's because we have copper oxide and aluminum oxide on the outsides of those conductors. Now, uh, if I was to draw the atomic formula, the formula for copper oxide, it would look like this. 
we would have C U two O. Now that means then that we've got two copper and one oxygen. Now we know copper had one in its outer valence shell, and then of course uh, oxygen needs two. So you're going to have the same situation as we did water, only we're going to have uh, copper and oxygen. If I if I have a uh, say a plus eight, here's my uh, aluminum or my uh, my uh, oxygen, and then here's my copper which has a plus 29, and it has one electron in its outer shell. It's going to share them with oxygen. Over here, we'll put another copper. And out here as well, we have this outer free electron being shared with, with, uh, with our oxygen. So that it makes both, it, there, there are no free electrons. Everything's all linked together to form a stable compound and it would then, of course, be non-conductive. Copper in itself would be conductive. However, it formed in a compound that's non-conductive. Now, copper oxides that got that characteristic uh, uh, green color. Copper oxide would appear green on the conductor. With aluminum oxide, we have the same situation. However, there we have a formula which would look like this. We would have Al2O3. Now, you remember in the outer shell of aluminum, we had three. It's got, a, it's got two subshells. We've got one complete subshell, but there's in the shell itself, there are three. Now, this would be a more complex molecule. Uh, it's going to take two aluminum going to take two aluminum, which would, would uh, with three in their outer shell, would, would amount to uh, six electrons. The holes we've got for them, the deficiency over here, we've got two times the three oxygen, which is six. So you can see we would have a complex molecule of two aluminum and uh, three uh, oxygen, you see, forming a compound. And then, of course, aluminum oxide will appear white. There are other ox metal oxides, and they all have their characteristic uh, uh, colors. Uh, iron is red and so on. I would like to add this on conductors while we're at it, and that's that when you splice conductors, you're splicing sleeves that have inhibitor in the inside. And that inhibitor has zinc chromate particles in, in the inhibitor. Now the purpose of this inhibitor and the zinc chromate chips in there is to bite through, is to cut through oxide that you may not have completely eliminated. You want to try and do the best you can when you uh, splice, but that the zinc chromate particles help to increase the, the conductivity of that sleeve. There's another thing that the inhibitor tends to do, and that's to eliminate oxygen and moisture, and that also would cut down any oxidation of your, of your material.